Welcome to another episode of Cafecito con Nacoa. Today we have a special guest joining us to shed light on a very important topic, COVID-19 treatments and medications. We are thrilled to have Dr. Hector Cabrera, Associate Chief Medical Officer for Premier Health. Dr. Cabrera will help us understand treatments that have become a great tool in our fight against the virus. In this first segment of our two-part series, we will learn more about what COVID-19 treatments are available, their effectiveness, and how they work, and we will discover who can benefit the most from these treatments. Get ready for a very informative cafecito. Welcome, Dr. Cabrera. There is treatment that's out there. Um, you know, number one, and still the most important in helping to protect our community are the vaccines. There's a new booster that's out there. I want to encourage everyone uh, to, to get it, you know, before the winter really sets in. It'll help protect you from getting infected if your antibodies are high, but also from developing severe disease. Now, in addition to that, we have treatments that are available or antivirals. Now, uh, there's three antivirals that we have, Paxlovid, uh, Remdesivir, and, and Molnopiravir. So there's three of them that are available and each of them are different. There are antivirals. These are pills for IV infusions that'll help your body fight the infection, and they've been proven to help people who are at high risk um, uh, uh, fight the illness and are less likely to go into the hospital or to die from this. The most effective are Paxlovid and then Remdesivir. Paxlovid is an oral pill that you can take, and it's been approved now for mild to moderate disease as an outpatient treatment. Um, it's a pill that you take if you're diagnosed with COVID. You need to call your doctor or go to an urgent care or go to your doctor's office and ask for this treatment, particularly if you're high risk. Remdesivir is a little bit trickier because it's an IV infusion. So uh, it can be arranged as an outpatient, but it requires infusion three consecutive days. So most of my patients that get that are the patients that end up going to the hospital and they receive it there. I mentioned there's three COVID antivirals first one is Paxlovid, about 85% risk reduction. So what does that mean? Um, uh, patients that took this medicine had um, 85% less likely to develop severe disease, end up in the hospital, end up intubated, or end up uh, with death, okay? Paxlovid. Second one, remdesivir equally as efficacious. So just as effective, over 80% risk reduction for the people that took it. Now, problems with remdesivir requires that IV infusion. So it's less accessible for our, 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 our patients as an outpatient. More people that get in and end up in the hospital get remdesivir. And then our third option is less effective. That's molnopiravir or Legevrio. And it's, it's pills, so it's an oral antiviral, um, and it's been shown to be about 30 to 35% risk reduction. So there's still a benefit, but obviously it's not as effective as Paxlovid, so we try to use Paxlovid first. Paxlovid is for 12 years and above. Paxlovid can be used in pregnancy, and again, 85% effective. Remdesivir, very effective, but requires that IV infusion, no concerns about drug-drug interactions, um, but usually used in the hospital. And then that third option, molnopiravir, 30 to 35% uh, risk reduction. So much less than Paxlovid, that's why that's our first choice, but 
35% lowering your risk of death or ending in the hospital is better than 0% risk reduction. So it's our alternative. There's no significant drug-drug interactions. That's why almost everyone can take molnupiravir. It's only indicated for 18 and above, so not for our youngest at-risk patients, and it's not used in pregnancy. Paxlovid is used in pregnancy. Those are the differences. I look and I teach the doctors that work in our clinic to kind of analyze uh, four things when they're evaluating the risk benefits of using these drugs. Who's going to benefit the most from these COVID antivirals? Number one is age. Anyone 50 and above clearly will benefit because they're at higher risk, particularly our patients that are 65 and older. So age. Number two is vaccination status. If someone, and again, there's a spectrum from having some immunity, partial immunity, being fully vaccinated, fully boosted is the lowest risk. Someone who maybe got their initial vaccines, uh, but's never had the illness, never got the boosters kind of in the middle. And then the patients that are at highest risk would be someone who never got any of the vaccines, never had COVID, or this is their first time with COVID, I worry about them. It's going to hit them harder, and so they'll benefit from the antiviral more. So age, vaccination status. Next, immunosuppression. Um, there are certain conditions and, and illnesses that severely suppress the immune system. And there's some conditions that mildly suppress the immune system. So again, there's a spectrum. Highest risk are our patients that maybe, um, you know, have cancer or receiving chemotherapy, have just undergone a stem cell transplant for a blood or a, a, a cancer like leukemia or lymphoma. Someone who uh, has received an organ transplantation like a kidney or a liver and is on immunosuppressive medications. Those are the ones, someone with AIDS, those are the patients I worry the most, but they have the weakest immune system, highest risk, absolutely would benefit from the uh, COVID antiviral. And then there's a series of illnesses that suppress the immune system or medications that suppress the immune system that would weaken the immune system, make people at risk as well, like someone with rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, someone who has a severe uh, lung disease that requires being on prednisone or cortisone all, all all the time. And then people with immunodeficiency disorders, there's illnesses that suppress those uh, immunoglobulins. And so those people are at risk. And then the fourth thing are medical conditions. So we know that people with diabetes, with high blood pressure, with kidney disease, with heart disease, with lung disease like asthma or emphysema are at higher risk. And what the scientists have figured out is the more illnesses, more of these illnesses, chronic illnesses, will increase your risk for developing severe disease. So we, uh, we, we teach our providers to consider their medical conditions like the ones I mentioned. Smoking is a risk factor, obesity is a risk factor, hypertension is a risk factor, diabetes, asthma, emphysema, those illnesses put someone at higher risk. So um, we consider that. They can have a huge impact. Um, so these antivirals, uh, they've been studied and what they've been proven is that they're effective in helping your body, your own immune system, fight the virus and they reduce the risk of developing severe disease. Severe disease primarily is when that virus goes down into your lung. It can result in pneumonia, respiratory failure. It's really what puts people in the hospital who develop COVID. These antivirals reduce that risk. It can make a huge impact. And I've seen it um, 
in uh, in my practice in the nursing home. It's a huge difference uh, now compared to before when we didn't have these tools. The number of patients when they get infected, um, you know, the uh, most of them now can be treated in the in their own home in the nursing home facility without uh needing to go to the hospital so less hospitalizations less pneumonias less deaths uh, among this highest risk population in the nursing home and the same can be for our latino community we know uh that our community was uh, disproportionately affected by COVID. What does that mean? It means that there were more hospitalizations and more death in Latino people than what we would expect based on their numbers. These antivirals can make a huge difference. Now, you've got to know about it. You've got to test if you suspect you have COVID. And if you test positive, do you need to go to your doctor or an urgent care or, or a community clinic and ask for this treatment, particularly if you're at high risk? And that brings us to the end of this episode of Cafecito con Nacua. Thanks to Dr. Cabrera for sharing his invaluable insights into the world of COVID-19 treatments. But wait, we still have more information to share. So don't forget to tune in for part two of this interview with Dr. Cabrera as we delve even deeper into this topic, exploring more aspects of this treatment and gaining more insights. Thank you for joining us today. And until then, stay informed and stay healthy. Hasta pronto.